Okay, so we've just had a great, uh, very varied selection of short films, everything from animation to films about mental health to uh, poignant comedy uh, and documentary. So a great selection. That's the beauty of film festivals, I guess. If um, you'd like to just introduce yourselves and, and your role in the film, please, just starting here. Well, uh, I'm Michael, and I've made documentary films for the last 50 years, only documentaries, and I prefer to work on my own without any um, distraction. And I edit um, myself as well. And that's a Danny, Danny's Red Box. Sorry, I that's Danny's Danny Red Box. Box. I'm Matt West. Um, I'm the writer, director, um, and camera editor on A Moment Ago. I'm Izzy White, and I'm the writer and animator of Fig Leaves. And I'm Angela Nacy. I co-wrote and co-produced Rose's Unicorn Delight. Great stuff. Um, first question, one for each of you, start at the far end. How, what's it like seeing your film, uh, film festival on a big screen? Is it something you've done a lot of, or does it get boring each time? Or? <laughs> boring? <Yeah. laughs> no. Um, I've done, we've done a few, but not loads. Um, and yeah, it's really, I like it. <laughs> yeah. What are you um, it's my first time putting one of my films on the big screen, so it was overwhelming, but pretty proud of myself, so <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, it was the first time on a big, definitely one this size. Uh, I've had like medium sized screen viewings of this particular film, but seeing it this size was quite special. And as we were just saying, the, um, just glad the camera held, to, held up with the resolution of it, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, the last time I think I was in a cinema was the National Film Theatre, and it was full. This is not quite as full as it was. <laughs> um, so, Michael, first of all, you said you've been making films 50 years. Uh, probably, yeah. I started on Standard 8 film. Okay. Um, and um, then um, one of the films won something, so I, it looked awful, <laughs> Standard 8. So I, I've used 16mm film for 10, 20 years until proper digital video, of course, which makes everything easier. Mm. What, what ignited that first passion to make film? I was, I've always been a photographer. I've still photographed photographs, and I've always liked seeing images. And a guy, we were on holiday, and a guy had a little 8 millimeter camera, and he was shooting um, stuff. And so I, I, I borrowed it, and, and I remember it was in Mallorca, 1956, I think it was, and there were some birds flying, a, a flock of birds, and I remember filming them uh, with his camera. And when I saw the results, I thought, oh, I, I want to make films. <laughs> um, what about you, Matt? What's your kind of background? How did you get into filmmaking? Uh, well, I, I come from a background of, I've always made films in my own time. I did some, I was, did a visual communication course at university like 20 odd years ago, um, which, kind of allowed you to do a bit of design, a bit of film, a bit of animation. And then in my career, I've been a designer, but I also now make films for brand campaigns, ad campaigns, and corporate films. And kind of that side of it's the day-to-day, -day, I suppose, but it allows me the equipment and the people that you meet to be able to make my own things. Mm -hmm. Izzy, what's your, what's your background? Uh, I went to university for film. Um, it was during COVID, though, so I didn't get a huge amount of hands-on practice really and it kind of pushed me into and the animation technique that I used in my film so I've not got background animation it was a first time thing just kind of threw myself into it so okay. yeah other than that yeah just film school really um, so this one's the second out of three films that I've made with, uh, <coughs> with a, a partner that I work with as well and this particular one it was made as part of um, we were members of BAFTA crew which is I don't know if you know it, it's like um, a group where that sort of uh, up and middle career people working in film and TV and they put us into groups and it was to do a micro shorts challenge. So it was supposed to be 60 seconds long. Right. Um, but we failed on that because <laughs> we realised we couldn't get it down to 60 seconds. So it's three minutes and something. We did make one that was 60 seconds. Okay. That's a real challenge. That's how I did it. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you think it's easier than you think, and then, yeah. Um, I wanted to just ask a question about the kind of the juggle between, you know, it starts out, it's quite a poignant piece, isn't it? You know, the, the, the little girl's uh, you know, lost a family member, and, and 
but there's one absolutely amazing sight gag in there. How did you kind of, uh, you know, marry the two tones together? I guess, um, I think with comedy, it often lands <coughs> harder if it's unexpected, so there's a twist at the end. So, yeah, we wanted to go for that, but then we thought the furthest... We knew what the gag was at the end we wanted, right. and we didn't quite know the beginning bit, and we thought if we can get it as far away from that at the beginning, mm. then it will be the, a bigger sort of expectation at the end. Yeah. Um, Izzy, so when I watched your, your animation, I was kind of struck by how the theme is about... I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, I, I kind of felt it's about artistic integrity and mm -hmm. being true to yourself, which is very much a modern kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but the style of animation is kind of fantasy, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's you know, pixies or what you know, whatever kind of creatures they are. <laughs> you'll correct me. But you know, how did you? What, what made you choose that kind of you know contradiction almost? I'd say the visual depiction is kind of what's going on in my head all the time. So <laughs> that's mainly where it came from. But yeah. I think <coughs> fantasy is a good way to subvert and talk about like the reality we live in because you can just go wherever you want with it and mm -hmm. make it whatever you'd like. And so it's a modern problem, the idea of censorship and altering what you believe to fit with the social standards. So with going fantasy, it's just kind of like those rules still exist there, but I can explore them more in that world in a different way, like put bars in the sky. It's a very literal um, interpretation of being caged in creatively, but in fantasy, you could just do that and no one questions it. Mm. So I think that that medium's really good for just exploring any social commentary you want. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, Matt, so this, your film felt very kind of real to me. There was lots of it where, you know, you're the writer, right? So what, yeah. what, what inspired you to make this film? Yeah. Uh, so it was the poem that's the overlay of everything that was something i wrote after the ending of a 17 year relationship in my marriage so it is quite real um but it was when i first wrote that poem it was very external and then i kind of rewrote it over two years just the poem without the idea of making a film um and then it became far more introspective and far more about just me rather than the other parties in everything and then i just started seeing um, visuals of it being kind of how it may come to life and that's where writing it into a film mm -hmm. version kind of came about but yes yeah, so it was a very very personal story yeah. um, so I'm grateful that a festival picked it up because it's one of those ones where you think it's so personal does it resonate with everyone mm -hmm. um, so I was pleased that it it, it did and you, you got that from it so. yeah it resonated with me that yeah. scene where well, in particular when he's kind of drinking in that circle of friends and all this stuff is going on around him and he's not there at all. Mm. I mean, I felt that before. It's just like a, you know, and the, just seeing it, it was like, yeah, that is, you got that bang on, I thought. Mm, thank you. So well done for that. Um, Michael, um, how did you come across the character of, of Danny and how did you find out um, his coffee box? I know Hampstead, I live there. Okay. And um, <coughs> I've seen him, uh, there were others using the boxes for different things, actually. Okay. Mm. And, um, I wanted to, uh, I looked for something unusual, that's all. <laughs> and I was lucky with the character. I didn't know he was a character until yeah, I spoke to him. Yeah. Um, I chatted to him and he was delighted. <laughs> He's quite a show off, so he didn't okay. mind the film being made yeah. at all. Yeah. In fact, I think he, he publicized it when it was on whatever, okay. went on Twitter or yeah, talking, yeah. whatever. But um, yeah, I, I've tried finding characters with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much kind of footage did you shoot? How much time did you spend with them? I took about maybe shooting time, four or five days, probably different okay. times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, let's talk about challenges. We want to start with you, Angela. What was your greatest challenge making this film, getting to where we are now? Um, so, in the original group that we had, uh, many people <coughs> dropped out of the project. Right. So I wasn't supposed to be producing it, but the producer dropped out. Um, then the art person dropped out. So we filmed it in Leamington Spa, which is where I'm from. And um, we had to borrow the location off a friend who luckily has a really nice house, so it looks nice. Uh, but my, my friend's sisters, who were like my childhood friends, also did all the art and the props, and they did it all the night before, because the art person dropped out the night before. 
um, and the original DOP dropped out, so I got my friend in. Okay. Um, so the challenges were just like trying to get people to do it, yeah. and then the other challenge. Oh, the director dropped out as well. So the, wow. the director who was originally on board isn't the was one it who ended you up said? directing oh. it. <laughs> I know. I don't know what happened. Who dropped out. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, because we were all brought, originally, we were just put together and we didn't all know each other. It was part of this um, thing. And then it ended up being just all of our mates that we knew making it together, okay. <laughs> which was nice in the end. Um, and then the other challenge was trying to make it really short. <laughs> Is it even about you? Um, definitely pandemic. Definitely pushed me into a box I didn't want to be in, really. Um, I had no access to equipment, really, or anything like that. Uh, but I already had the concept and the drive to do it, so I uh, laid down a green screen on my floor because it's all um, paper craft puppets and they're flat on the ground. So I was filming it on my living room floor, taped to my floor, housemate stepping around me. Um, the only real support I had was my housemate and my friends that could mingle with me. So just going there alone, but I wasn't like really alone really because I had people supporting me, but it was just such an effort and it took me about two years overall, yeah. doing most of it on my own. But and the amount of times I gave up, the amount of times I was saying, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, and I just went, but I am though, aren't I? <laughs> and got to the end and it was rewarding. So I'm glad I overcame that challenge because I'm, I'm really proud of myself for it. Good, sure. Matt, what was the greatest challenge for you? I mean, I've had past shoots where yeah, people don't turn up, you have power cuts, you have all sorts of things go wrong. But I've got to say, in terms of actually shooting this, I don't think anything went wrong. I got quite lucky. Um, I literally shot it just me with the camera. I had a friend on one day bit assist and a friend, a different friend on the other day assist. And it was just me and the actor, basically, the actual shooting. So I think that keeping it tight meant we avoided challenges in terms of actually the process of shooting. But I'd say the biggest challenge was just emotionally of the story that I was visiting. And um, it became quite cathartic, but it, there were moments where it kind of you, you revisit and it's just like hits you quite hard. And then I found out when we were shooting the pub scene, when we were finished, we were just having a drink. And it was the first time I'd really sat and personally spoken to the actor uh, other than talking about the film. Mm. And it turned out he knew my ex, my ex-wife. Yeah. So it's like... I'd met him through a wholly different route, so that was a challenge, just suddenly being like, oh, emotionally, it was a yeah. challenge. How did you, can I ask you something? The dolly shots, um, did you, well, you have a dolly, a trolley? No, that was all a Ronan S gimbal, wow. all handheld, so I was just walking along, and um, Sam, who's just Steady over there, she was, she was my assistant who was assisting and was meant to be spotting me, uh, but she let me walk into a lamppost, so <laughs> <laughs> on a busy Soho street. So. Someone held focus very well all the time. You lost it once only. Yeah, that was me doing it live. I didn't, couldn't, didn't have a puller or anything, so yeah, I got quite... Oh, very good. Yeah. What was your greatest challenge? My greatest challenge was trying to make it visually interesting because it's a small box and I couldn't sure. get into it properly and I tried to get the camera close, you know, to take some, for the montage. Um, that's the big problem in documentaries. It might be an interesting subject, then you've got to make it visually interesting, and that's, that's the challenge, um, basically. So what kind of things would you do, you know? Well, plenty of cutaways. What, what kind of things do you do, yeah, to make it interesting? Cutaways. Well, hopefully the subject is, it can be visual as well. Um, I've done stuff on, on other people doing more interesting things, like area, a trapeze artist or... A, okay. uh, um, but um, this was, he's in one place, very static, so that was the challenge, to mm. keep the visuals interesting. Mm. Was there any burning questions in the audience at this point? Um, yes, I wanted to ask a question about the moment ago. Um, you said that you were really proud of your performance, but you didn't think you were going to get anywhere near it. Um, what was the point of that? And what was the point of that? As, as quick as it took for him to change his top, sort of, we've literally just... <laughs> I was, I was stood in the bath at that point because it's the only way I could get a shot because we used his apartment, the actor's apartment, so it was very tight. Um, I just stayed in the bath while he disappeared into the next room, switched top, came in, we'd marked the spot, shot another couple of seconds. So, it's, yeah, it was like probably up 20 minutes just back and forth, just him changing his tops. It worked very well. Thank you. I thought you... Mm. 
did you enjoy making your films? Did you actually enjoy them? Did you get to enjoy making them? Oh, me? Yeah, well, oh, yeah. With all of you, yeah. Well, I, I do. I do it for fun, luckily, not for money, not for as a career, so yeah. I can do it for fun. Yeah, I love it. The editing as well. Is your editing the favourite part or the shooting? Oh, no, I like shooting as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it is enjoyable. It's, um, and again, day job being film-based, it's always more enjoyable when you can actually tell your own stories rather than the story for a client or whatever. Um, but the enjoyable part for me was when, in editing, you'd obviously, when you edit it, you start to see the film over and over again so many times that you start to lose the love of it a little bit. But then, as soon as I gave it to my sound designer and he added all of the foley, then I enjoyed it again. So you kind of go up and down of how much you're enjoying it. No, yeah, I definitely enjoyed the process. I enjoy any time that I get to bring that kind of stuff to life, those characters that I make and the stories I want to tell. Like, of course, like it's challenging, but I think the end is worth the reward. So, yeah, um, I think the most enjoyable thing was getting to make a unicorn penis out of fun. <laughs> 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 Enjoy that then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a question for Rosie's. Uh, are, you, are you the director or the producer? Uh, no, I'm, I wrote it and produced it. Oh, awesome. uh, how did the credit scene came about? I thought that was super original. Maybe, maybe that. Oh, so it came about because the inspiration for the story was from a Bored Panda article, which was Epic Cake Fails. I don't know if you've ever seen them, that there's some on various different platforms when they show you the cake that someone tried to make and then the actual one they made, and they, they are really funny. But we sort of thought, well then, what if there's like a nice heartfelt story behind that and some love behind it, even if it all goes to pot in the end. So yeah, so that's why we used that at the end as like a mock-up of that kind of article as well. Yeah, so do you have any story similar to hers about a third to to your, to your uh, left, uh, in terms of just having to utilize the resources you had available, because she you know, worked through a pandemic. Um, in your 50 years, you know, with, with filmmaking, do you have any similar stories where you're starting out and you had to kind of bootstrap to really get a project done, and how that has sort of shaped your career? Well, um, I don't really have a career. Um, I, um, I always try and make films which, um, would be interesting to audiences, obviously, um, festivals and, and other, other things. Um, but um, I don't do sort of cutting edge stuff. I remember uh, uh, Channel 4 saw one of my films and, uh, and we wondered when they were going to show it. And they said, no, no, we want cutting edge. Well, there are some very good social things done, um, obviously, um, particularly now with, with immigration and whatever which are more um, political, perhaps. I, I, I'm a bit too anodyne nowadays for the, for the present um, style, I think. Um, a bit old-fashioned, probably. Um, but one thing I would say about films <coughs> and documentaries, that a lot of documentaries I, I watch, there's a voice off asking questions, which I, I never think works at all. I much prefer to ask my questions off camera quietly to the bloke and then tell the subject, look, just talk. Because with video, we're not having film rattling through a gate at God knows how much a second. We can just let the camera run. I always let people talk, just let them talk and then use what they've said. Um, but um, I, I didn't actually quite catch the tenor of your question, I must confess. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to ask wherever you are. Who was it? I'm in the back. I just asked, like, just about, you know, starting out, what were some of the, do you have any similar moments where you kind of had to bootstrap? You didn't know, like, how things may have not even happened the way you wanted to have, like, at the time? Oh, and God, no. No, things, things never happen when, uh, how, you, how you expect. No. Um, you've got to shoot. No, that's, I, I, I don't know how the <coughs> BBC write a documentary uh, before they shoot it, because, well, they have to, I guess, because they've, they've got crew and they've got everybody um, on lots of money and they, they can't waste time. My films evolve as I shoot them, really, uh, every time. I may, I may find the character. Um, I found a, a lady trapeze artist once, and um, 
followed her for a few weeks or months. But my films really evolve after I've shot them. When I've got the stuff, I can then say, now what am I going to do? And then the edit. Um, because things never work out as you, as you want. Even when they're shooting, these guys will probably tell you that things don't always work out as you expect anyhow. So shoot first and then see what we <laughs> could do with it. Um, so I had a question about, um, first of all, what's your next project going to be for each one of you? And also, kind of the second part of that, if money was no object, what kind of film would you love to make? Uh, Michael, you can either talk about documentary or his maybe a fiction. Well, documentary, I, I can yeah, say who would, you, who would your subject be? Wow. Well, choose anyone. The ideal subject would be someone who's wonderful on camera, does something very interesting. <laughs> um, I have got an idea. Uh, there's, there's a street cleaner somewhere in London who plays a, an instrument, I think, while he's on duty, so to speak. And I was thinking of filming him, but <clears throat> I don't think there's a story there, unfortunately. So I, I'm a bit stuck for subjects at the moment. Um, I'm, uh, I'm getting too old, and my uh, sort of creative juices are drying up, I'm afraid. There might be a story once you speak to them. There might be a story. Maybe, them, right? maybe. Uh, Matt? Well, in terms of next projects, I've got, I'm working on two new short films. Um, one is like a dance-based piece, and then another one is um, a nice sort of family kind of narrative. So two very different stories. But that's the advantage of short films. You can kind of try things you've never done before. Um, and if money wasn't an object, my dream film is to make a Lord of the Rings style film for a fantasy book called Earthsea. Okay. And that's like a massive world kind of, uh, yeah, fantasy dragons, magic and stuff. Like that would need a massive budget, but uh, that would be my dream job. <laughs> uh, for my next project, um, it's something I've been working on for a while that I'd like to get back to was, um, I kind of moved into interactive film um, kind of like Band of Snatch, Black Mirror kind of okay. film. And I was doing it, um, it puts you in the mind of someone who's supporting an elderly patient of dementia. Um, and it's, it's based on my own experiences, but it's like a sound-based interactive film. It's a little bit experimental, but I really like to get back into it because I was enjoying it, but I wore off it a little bit. But I'm hoping after this especially to get back into that. Um, a big ideal like project. Honestly, if I could just make a massive film of everything that comes into my brain, <laughs> I would enjoy doing that. It would probably look a lot like fig leaves, but on a massive scale, so I couldn't narrow it down at the moment, I don't think. <laughs> um, so me and my writing partner have just finished a 10-minute short, um, which is actually going on to iPlayer um, later mm. this week, which yeah. is exciting. It's called Man Eater. It's a comedy horror about, again, it's got a bit of a twist. That's our sort of thing. Um, so it's about a woman who gets a wolf whistled by a man and that transforms her into a werewolf and then she ends up eating him. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's a bit gory. What's it called? Man Eater. <laughs> it's already ended into his wolf. Quite obvious, yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> And we're also working on another short, which is sort of about a kidnap, and then the twist is it's a mother who's kidnapped her neighbour because she really wants to go out and she needs her, baby, her kids looking after. So she's sort of kidnapped for the purpose of babysitting because she's quite desperate. And then there's some more twists in it as well. Yeah. Oh, um, and if, yeah, God, if I could do any big, big film, I'd love to do like a big, massive, like action, Mission Impossible, but like a comedy, female-led version. Great, I love all the sound of all of those. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you, for submitting your film and joining us from near and far. Thank you so much, and can I have one more round of applause, please, for our <laughs>